Welcome. Once again, Anarchist Days, still going on, together with Datenspuren. Um, we are very happy that you're here. Uh, this is a third talk on um, the, the situation in Palestine, Israel, that we have today. Um, and now we have a friend, a comrade, also talking a little bit about the perspective from the Israeli side um, of, the, of the situation, of the conflict, of the war. And I won't introduce you. You can introduce yourself. Um, I think that would be way better. Um, you will say what is important for you. And I'm not going to be this weird person making accents where it's not required. Uh, yeah. Uh, you will also have a possibility to ask questions after the talk. And because it's online talk, you, are not be able, you won't be able to ask the questions during the talk. Uh, one more thing, we still need donations so for like paying the event. Uh, so if you have some money left, uh, feel free to drop it in donation boxes or actually like grab some food but pay for it 100 euro or whatever you have in your pockets. Um, yeah, most probably that will happen, right? Um, yeah, so thanks again. It's hard that you can be here um, and I give you the, the room. Uh, you, you can't see the room once again, like last year, uh, you felt a little bit weird, right? Um, the weirdness continues, so that's, that's the reality we live. Um, and just to let you know, I think like there are around maybe 30, 35 people in the room right now. Uh, yeah. And they're waving, there's some person waving, but you can't see them. Um, they can't see you, right? Um, just to let you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I'm muting myself, so you don't get the feedback, and yeah, thanks once again. Great, thank you. Um, so, hi, my name is Sahar, I'm from Jerusalem, born and raised, and have been active in different anti-occupation, anti-apartheid, uh, anarchist uh, movements and others um, in this piece of land for about 20 years now. Uh, I was a country objector, refused my military service, um, and have been really active in a variety of different uh, geographical areas, um, from the kind of protest against the wall back in uh, the mid 2000s um, to a more protective presence and accompaniment work that I will speak about a bit later today in Masafiriata, um, in the south of the West Bank, um, in struggles in East Jerusalem, but also around kind of countering militarization within Israeli society. I'm currently active with a lot of different activist groups, uh, both in Jerusalem and in Haifa, which I just moved to. Um, and I'll try to give you a bit of, I don't even know if it's an overview, but a bit of an update um, on what's been going on from my perspective with the radical Israeli left in, over the past year. Um, and I will say in advance, I mean, first of all, this is my perspective. Um, and obviously will not be covering everything. And secondly, I think that this is a year for a lot of people and for a lot of reasons, um, but where it, there are far less answers than there are questions um, in, in the way that we do activism and in, in what our, target, uh, our targets are in activism and things of the sort. So I think that a lot of what I'll be talking about today is, is those questions um, and kind of the need for a reevaluation. Um, and I'll also speak to why I think that uh, there is that need. Um, I will start by saying that I think that there's the assumption for many is that some of the reevaluation within the Israeli left um, has to do with kind of the, the shock of October 7th. And in a way, you know, uh, uh, feeling of betrayal or things of the sort, I will say that in the radical left that I am part of, that is not at all the case. Um, the kind of the shock, the conversations, the questions uh, are happening. I think they're important, but that is not their reasoning. And I'll speak a bit about what I think their reasoning is. Um, I'm gonna just share my screen, if I will manage to. One second, sorry. Um, just because I, as I can't see you, then I don't want you to be looking at me the entire time. Um, and instead, I'll, yeah, I have just a, a few pictures to accompany this talk. Um, so first of all, I think what's been happening over the past year is a attempt to refine our place in the struggle. And when I say our place in the struggle, a lot of it is what I mean is just technically. 
Um, I think for activists who've been doing this for a very long time, and I'm sure that for a lot of you, this is the same in your own context, you have the things you know how to do, right? You organize protests, vigils, certain kinds of direct actions. There's, there's a toolbox um, that as activists we have and we, we constantly grow. But that's what we're used to doing. And every time there's an attack on Gaza, and this is definitely not, although this is by far the worst attack on Gaza, it's definitely not the first one. We have an MO, right? We go out to the streets, we protest. Um, sometimes we try to block military bases, sometimes you know, more direct actions. But we, we have a toolbox of what we know to do in these situations. And that toolbox felt irrelevant or impossible for the majority of the past year. And I'll just to give a, a small example of, of what I mean, um, in the first few weeks, just after uh, October 7th, while again, Gaza was being bombed. And at this point, there are already uh, over a dozen, uh, like over 12,000 um, people in Gaza who were killed. Uh, this is just a few weeks in, into the attack. And there was a protest um, in Jerusalem that you can see the picture of here, which is, you know, hardly 20 people <laughs> that was at this point, not even protesting the war. We at this point already tried to do four or five protests against the war. All of those protests were, were completely uh, beaten up in, in a matter of minutes, could not hold for a minute. Um, and so we were still not even sure how to protest the war. And then there was an incident in which a group of Palestinian citizens of Israel um, attempted or asked for a license for a protest against the war. Um, this was not given to them and they were arrested. And then we were protesting the silencing of a protest. Um, and that's, you know, these 20 something people standing on a sidewalk in city center Jerusalem outside the police station of Jerusalem. Right after this photo was taken, the entire protest was beaten with clubs. The police chased us for almost an hour down any streets we went to. Like there was no way to end. Um, the like you couldn't even go home. We were just chased and chased and chased. Um, and this was something that became a bit of a norm for the first two or three months uh, of the war. So our normal tools of protesting, what we can or cannot do, felt impossible. So that's one reason um, that I think we kind of changed or, or had to ask ourselves, what is it that we do do? The other reason is that the level of grief people were feeling um, was more intense and, and much more than in previous wars on a personal level, um, partially because a lot of the activists or almost everyone in Israel knows someone who was killed on October 7th or taken hostage or their families were um, killed. Uh, there are activists that were active with us um, in different solidarity protests and actions that were killed on October 7th. So part of it was that kind of circle of grief that hit people very personally. And added to that was also that for those of us who did have friends um, and comrades in Gaza, a lot of them also uh, were killed just because of you know, the scale of killing um, in, in Gaza by Israel. And so there was a huge amount of grief uh, that was held. Um, Sure. No, that's fine. Um, where am I? Let's see. Do you see it now? Okay. Thank you. Um, so the level of grief was, was something that was very much held by a lot of people and we're all, you know, emotional people together with being political and trying to understand what do you do with that grief. Um, one of the earliest examples that I think we were able to do is this action uh, in November. Um, this was after uh, a comrade of a lot of us, um, an activist from Gaza, Khalil, was killed. 
And in a time where we felt like we couldn't protest, we knew we'd be beaten up for any form of protest. Um, and we did want to hold something that, that is a vigil as well. Um, and the people in this picture are holding pictures of people who were killed at that point since October 7th, including both uh, Israelis and Palestinians, the majority obviously being Palestinian statistically, um, but also Israelis and sharing words of um, fallen comrades in, in Gaza and from within Israel. Um, and this was one of the first, and when we, we organized this, we assumed we won't be able to do it, right? We had a million kind of backup plans and even just holding something like this in a park where nobody sees it and, and nobody even interacts with it felt scary and hard. Um, but it is something that we, we did manage to do. But I think that that, uh, that understanding of grief was also something that the community held. And it's a community that's used turning grief into action. Um, and I think that that's true for a lot of activists. Um, we were kind of quoting the, I think it's a Mother Jones quote, uh, saying, mourn the dead and fight like hell for the living. Um, and I think that, that when you try to do that, but you also feel like you don't know how to fight at the time, um, it put us in a very complicated position that I still don't think we have all the tools out of it. But just to say that this continued, and, and we are now at a point where there are far more protests and a lot of what's happening uh, in Gaza. This is an example of the first protest that happened outside Siteiman, which is a torture camp um, that in the last month or two months has become much more in the headlines. But this, this protest uh, was already quite a few months ago. It was the first uh, protest, protest of the kind outside of it, talking about the torture there, um, as well as, as calling for, for the end of the war. And these kind of actions continue constantly. One of the things that has happened, I think, more than in previous um, rounds, just because of both the severity of the bombing in Gaza um, and the killings and the, I mean, the complete destruction, that the severity of that, together with a level of nationalism within Israeli society that has always been very high in, during military operations and we're a very militarized society, we always have been. But in the past year, that has increased a thousandfold. Um, and it comes with much more, again, emotions for people um, and therefore much more kind of passionate hate. I don't, I don't have another term for it, unfortunately. Um, and it meant that our protests were not only being suppressed much more, it also felt like they don't have meaning as much um, and, and that there's not that many people even listening. And so as activists, a lot of the question becomes, what are we doing? What are we doing it for? How, like, what, what do our actions actually manage to do? Um, and I think that one of the things that's happened alongside these protests continuing is that a lot of energy of activists um, has shifted much less to protest and direct actions and things of the sort, and much more to um, just solidarity work and protective presence in the West Bank, in Palestinian villages. This is something that has existed for decades. Um, and in the last few years, there's been a huge increase in the amount of Israeli activists doing protective presence in Palestinian villages, meaning going with Palestinians to herd their sheep in areas where settlers or soldiers are likely to um, harass them, attack them, and, and so on, being in villages um, that are under threat. Again, these things have happened long before October 7th, but in the first month after October 7th, 16 Palestinian communities in these areas, in these rural Palestinian communities, were displaced um, by settler violence and threats. Um, which is a completely unprecedented uh, number when we think about the West Bank. So a lot of the activist energy has shifted towards doing this kind of protective presence work in many ways, I think, because it's one of the last things that you feel like it means something, that your activism actually has meaning and, and you, it's tangible. You can, see, um, yeah, you can see what you're doing. So that's kind of a bit of a summary of where I think a lot of, of the activism um, is. The next question for me that, again, has shifted a bit is this question of what are we struggling against? What are we fighting against? Um, and the core of it has not changed, right? We are still fighting an occupation, apartheid, 
now with with the added levels of, of genocide, but the structure itself is very much the same structure um, and hasn't fundamentally changed. But some things have changed about it. Um, first of all, the, the velocity has changed. I mean, there, it, it's not, uh, even though it's a question of, of quantity and not quality, quantity matters um, in that context. Also, the situation within Israel, the space to be able to criticize these things, the space to be able to try to have conversations has shrunken dramatically. And it's not that it was huge before, but it has shrunken dramatically. Um, and part of that shrinking is, is that there is there is a growing, I, I, I don't like using necessarily terms like fascism because I think that a lot of historical terms are very specific. Um, but there is a far more totalitarian, far more police state um, than there was before. Again, this is a process that started before October 7th, but that October 7th accelerated it um, dramatically. And so this, what are we struggling against um, is also what's happening within Israel um, in relation to the occupation, but also within, uh, within Israel. Okay, I can do that. If I if I don't uh, go into like the big thing mode, does it change if it's I'm if I'm here? Okay, so maybe I just won't uh, go into the sh presentation mode. Um, if if you can see it large enough. Um, so just going back for the pictures that I assume you've missed, this was the picture from the protest outside Steteman, outside the torture camp. Um, and this was the picture of protective presence um, in the Palestinian village called Twani in the South Hebron Hills in South Riyadh. So this is where we were at, at the what, what are we struggling against? Um, so I think that one place that relatively we could find ourselves a bit more is kind of the more classic we're struggling against a war, against the genocide, against the bombing very, very concretely. Um, and a lot of that has been saying, well, if, if we don't see so much traction uh, within Israeli society and the potential for that is obviously very limited at the moment, um, then we should be kind of lending our voice to what is happening internationally to try to prevent this. And a lot of that is ar around the arms uh, embargo or a call for arms embargo um, against Israel. And so this specifically is from a protest outside the British consulate just a few months ago um, before the British decided to halt some of the arms sales to Israel. Um, and there's a lot of kind of protests of, of the sort. So this is the kind of traditional, um, you know, what are we fighting for? But I think what became much more complicated is that a lot of us have been part, uh, and that includes myself, uh, part of the protests for a hostage deal. And as far as I'm concerned, I think a lot of us, um, we both genuinely believe in a hostage deal. We, we genuinely, genuinely want to see the hostages coming uh, back home, obviously. Um, we also know that that deal is probably the, the most, most relevant or fastest way to a ceasefire um, and therefore to stop what's happening in Gaza, or at least decrease it dramatically. Um, and so as far as we're concerned, this kind of like the calling for a hostage deal within the Israeli context, it is a win-win, right? Um, and so we've been very active within these, uh, within these spaces. Um, we've also added voices that are more clearly against the war within these spaces. But then part of what happens is being in those spaces is, is seeing that these spaces are a lot of different things, including some that are very hard to stand behind. So I want to say this is not necessarily representative of the entire um, kind of pro hostage movement or, or movement for a deal, um, which a lot of them I, I have huge respect to and have been doing amazing work. But also some of that movement um, it is, I think, exemplified in this uh, poster campaign from just two weeks ago um, that roughly translates into bringing them back and then going back in. Um, in Hebrew, it's more catchy, but mainly 
the, the message is, let's do a deal, take the ceasefire that's needed. If we need to get out of Gaza for this, we will get out of Gaza for this. And once they are back home, then we go back to Gaza, as in we go back to erasing Gaza. Um, and that is like when we're thinking about what are we fighting against, it becomes complicated but we, because we find ourselves find, fighting against the nationalism uh, that has always been there, but that we're also standing with um, in this context of, of the protests. And so this is kind of another layer added to that. Um, just to make it more complicated, I think we also need to remember this kind of what are we fighting against um, also translates when we speak about what happens in the Palestinian discourse and in our interaction with Palestinian discourse. Um, and you know, most of our direct partners, my direct partners and friends um, are obviously, Palestinians are obviously very much horrified by, by what happened on October 7th, um, as well as obviously very horrified and or killed by um, what Israel has done in Gaza and the West Bank since. And yet there was a moment where the, there, there is, and not just a moment, there is a question of, you know, we, although we are anarchists and very anti-national in our essence, um, here with a Palestinian state not yet existing um, and a call for independence around that, we are supporting uh, to an extent a national movement. Um, and because that, that's part of what Palestinian liberation is calling for. And within that support for national liberation, armed resistance is often part of national liberations. Um, and there is a voice within Palestinian society, including within Palestinian more left-leaning society that says, this is part of it. We might not like it, but this is part of it. Um, and that's obviously a very difficult uh, space for, for us. And kind of, I think brings back this question of how do we interact with nationalism? Um, and how do we interact with, with violent nationalism and with a complication of what does it mean when it comes from a liberation movement or not? Is this a liberation movement? There's a lot of questions to ask around that. Um, and I think that, that kind of is also part of the question. I, I chose to bring here a quote from um, a Palestinian activist who wrote already in, in she actually originally wrote this, I think, in, in the end of October. Uh, this was translated in November, Rajana Tur. Um, and she wrote an entire piece about this, but the, the kind of quote there is, my and she's Palestinian, my national liberation and the national liberation of my people do not include a Jeep speeding through the streets of Gaza with a half-naked Jewish woman strapped in its front. Um, and she writes this from, from a feminist perspective. She's a known feminist activist. Um, but I think, for, for many in, in the Palestinian left, that has also been part of the discourse. And it, and it, which, you know, obviously I can very much relate to, but I think we need to recognize that this is also part of, uh, of the conversation of what are we fighting against and how does nationalism look like and where do we put our boundaries um, around that. And then the last question that I think we are all struggling for, which very much connects to what I was just speaking to is the question of what are we struggling for? Um, and I think that this is something that for me, and again, this is just my own analysis, but for me, it's something that we really have always needed to ask ourselves in a clearer way, um, but that over the past year became far more urgent. I think that for myself and many others around me, we, I think maybe rightfully so historically, postponed that question. Uh, the question of what is, what, what's, what is, what are things gonna look like here? We're very good at saying what we're against, right? We want to see a decolonized space. Uh, we want to see occupation or apartheid ending. We want, like, there's a lot of things that we are clearly against and want to see end. But the question of what are we struggling for? What does that look like? The whole two state, one state, five states, you know, discourse is something that in many ways we said, that's not the question right now. We should be currently focusing on how do we create leverage? How do we create, create power to have Palestinians even be able to be on a negotiation table where those conversations happen? Um, and I think that that was maybe right for the time, 
But in a way, what it has meant is that a lot of our movement, and here I, I dare speak about uh, the international um, Palestinian liberation movement, has been to an extent slightly depoliticized in the sense that it is very ideological. It knows very much what it is against. It knows what justice looks like in its eyes, um, but it is not as good in drawing a roadmap to how do we achieve that justice? What are the steps, the one, two, three, four, that happen politically speaking, the political conversation that needs to happen in order for us to see that change? Um, and I think part of the reason for that, and again, this is just my opinion, but I think part of the reason for that is that the occupation to an extent with how terrible that it is, was bearable was bearable enough that you could think about long-term strategies that are thinking about change in 20 or 30 or 40 years, um, that you could talk about justice and not talk about the next urgently needed step because it was, it was normalized in a sense. Now, this is a terrible thing to say, obviously, this cannot be normalized, but people learn to live in all situations. And I think that one of the things the last year has done is, is shake it, make it unstable, make it something that we cannot wait for, remind us of the urgency of what is happening. And for me, I think one of the questions moving forward with that reminder agency is our responsibility to think politically, to think about, well, how do we believe change happens? Um, and, and what are the next steps that we need for that? And we can see around the world, the kind of international pressure in Israel and, and public opinion is shifting. It's shifting dramatically and fast and it's about time. I mean, it's way too late, but it's about time. Um, and it's shifting. I mean, it's terrible that this tragedy had to happen for that shift to happen. But you see that, you see mass protests uh, across Europe. I know this is more complicated in Germany, but other places in Europe, um, in, in the US, uh, in the global South, I mean, in Latin America, in, there's a lot of places. Um, and the, the political discourse is shifting and we see it in UN resolutions um, and who is voting for them and who is no longer vetoing them or even no longer opposing them. Um, we see huge, huge shifts in, in supporting Palestinian liberation in different ways. But what we still don't see is the translation of that into political power, the translation to that into a political roadmap of how does that end the occupation apartheid and, and right now, more urgently, the genocide. Um, and I think that that's kind of a place that, that I think a lot of the people here in, in, in more or less words um, are, are struggling with with what is our role in that um, and what is that role roadmap and within that roadmap, what is the role of us as uh, whatever, Israeli, Jewish left, um, the, the small minority, radical minority that we are uh, here in the country with, with the tools that we have. So I think for me, those are kind of the main questions that are happening and, and the main um, thoughts of, of the past year. And I, I think that maybe at, at that, I will open it this up uh, more into questions and a conversation to not feel like I'm speaking to myself too much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear my voice right now somehow in a way. Um, yeah. I will kind of um, give the microphones to people with questions and then hopefully you can understand them and if not, I try to repeat them for you. So, there's one question here. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Um, a, a yeah, little? more or less. Okay, hi, Ms. Shahab uh, Badi. I hope I'm right with the pronunciation. Uh, I'm from a local anti-fascist group uh, and do a lot of research about fascist movements. And 
I find a lot of blind spots in your speaking, beginning with the foundation at uh, the founding of the Palestine movement by Great Mufti Al Husseini, I'm sure you know it. And the SS, Heinrich Schimmler. Great Mufti Heil Husseini was in Germany visiting concentration camps. He got his support for the founding of the Palestine movement by Hitler. Everyone can read it. There's a Wikipedia article even about that, Great Mufti Al Husseini. And we can even find in the 1980s a strong close cooperation bet between the PLO and far right extremist movements like the Wehrsportgruppe Hoffmann, the biggest German far right extremist movement that did terrible attacks, like on the Oktoberfest. Even this you can find on it in Wikipedia and many other sites. So you call it a liberation movement, what was founded by die hard fascists. May it has a little shift. I know a lot of lefties today still trap into the narratives of liberation movement and so on, but I can see it in mass protests on the today, like in Berlin. There are very, very open sympathies for Hamas. You can find Hamas symbols every, everywhere. And please, don't forget, the Hamas was democratic elected on 2005. Cars for their charter. The charter calls for a genocide against the Jews worldwide. And for me, it reminds me very, very strong on NS Germany. Yeah. It was a question, why do you apply that history? There's a big important background. And yeah, I don't know. That's a really important point. Don't blind it. Um, so I'm not sure I heard every word of that, um, but a bit a bit of the background. So I, I apologize if I don't completely respond to respond to everything. But um, I think I more or less understand it. I think I mean I won't go into into the historical uh, relationships. Uh, definitely not not uh, the ones during. Well, I I think it's not exactly the time. But my my very broad question is uh, answer to that is that those relationships are extremely minor relatively to all other relationships that the Nazi government has had with European countries in which we don't hold that at all as part of the conversation. Um, but, sorry, but, but, but let, me, uh, let me answer the, the gist of your question, which I think is, is the, an important part, which is around criticism of Hamas today um, and, and understanding that uh, to be very clear, Hamas is a right-wing party. It's an Islamist party. Um, its relationship to a, a lot of, of the rights and uh, liberties that, as anarchists, we call to are very clear. Like it, it, it is far very oppressive. And I have many friends in Gaza um, who have been arrested and um, oppressed by this political party um, and by Hamas, right? There's no question about that. It is a right-wing um, organization. I think that there is a question of what do you do with a population that is ruled by right-wing parties, including when that population originally voted them in, hasn't actually had an election for a decade, but what, what does that mean? Does that give legitimacy to oppressing that population? Uh, if so, what does that mean about the Israeli society that has been voting for extreme right-wing parties for a very long time now. Um, I think part of what we usually say as anarchists is that is not relevant. That we are fighting for people's rights and we see them as people even if they are living under a right-wing government. Even if some of them support that right-wing government. Um, that they should still should not be killed and so on. So I think for me that's kind of the bottom line of this conversation, even though we can get into the actual history of the creation of Hamas and PLO and relationship to the right wing and Israel's relationship to right wing governments around the world. Like there's a lot to say about that. But the bottom line is that the fact that there is a huge amount of nationalism and right wing in this piece of land from the river to the sea. And there is a huge amount of that. Um, when I say that, you know, as as leftists here, we are a minority. It's not just within the Jewish society that we are a minority. We are generally a minority. But I don't think that that in any way should jeopardize our ideology and how we respond to it and what we criticize. Um, thank you. Are there, are there any other questions?
Sorry, bitte. Mach ruhig. Wir, können, wir, wir führen keinen Dialog hier. Wir würden Fragen stellen an der Stelle und respektieren, was äh, Sie dazu sagen möchte auch. Are there any other questions? Sorry, there's a short interruption here. We will continue soon. Okay, so, sorry for that somehow. Um, we will continue with the next question. Maybe we can um, use this opportunity to talk to you and um, and uh, could you maybe say more about like your perspective or your group's perspective or leftist perspective from Asia, Israel about um, like what is happening on this political um, uh, yeah on the on the political oh I don't I don't find a word right now um, but yeah how how would you how would you say something about like what's happening with the UN and um, what's your opinion on that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think what's happening in, in the UN is important in, in a symbolic sense. Uh, it is important to see resolutions that could not pass a year ago pass today. And I think that has to do with this feeling of urgency. Um, I think if, if we look historically at kind of the international community, uh, there's always been officially, you know, a, the occupation is illegal. Uh, we want a two state solution. Israel should not be occupying Palestinian territories and end the siege on Gaza. Like that was always kind of the general international discourse of the majority of the world. But there was no will um, to put any political skin in the game, right? To, to make any po strong political stances on it. It was in a way uninteresting um, or not worth the, the political risk. And I think that that is something that has changed. And this is a bit what we see in this resolution, a beginning of that change. That said, it is a very slow and symbolic one. Uh, I mean, when we actually see change, it's when change happens in the Security Council and not when change happens in, in the General Assembly, because as we know, the UN system is an extremely non-democratic system um, in which if, if the permanent members of the General Security decide that something does not happen, it will not happen. Um, and I think for me, that's the interesting question. When when is this change that we are already seeing happening affect enough um, also the level of the Security Council um, where we can actually talk about arms embargoes and actual sanctions? Um, I think that on that level, it's important to say with all the criticism, and there's a lot of criticism on this international mechanism of the UN, it does theoretically have the tools to do quite a lot. And especially in a country like Israel that most of its economic ties um, and most of its its relations are to European, US, um, also, I mean, India, but countries that generally actually do to a degree um, cooperate with the UN and, and require UN legitimacy. Um, there are a lot of tools that the Security Council could have that would actually be able to just end this war. Um, if, if it if it went there. So we're not there yet, um, but I think it's, yeah, I, I hate saying that it's a step in the good direction just because it's it's so slow. Like every, every one of these steps, like people are dying every single day. I will also say from my standpoint, living in Haifa, like we are literally every day now just waiting for the widening of, of the war in the North. Um, and, and you know what, and, and People are dying over here as well. I mean, mostly in, in southern Lebanon, but like every day, not just in Gaza, people are dying because countries that say that they're against this um, and that say that it has to stop and that it has to stop in an agreement. And I think that is clear to everyone. There will eventually be a ceasefire are not willing to put political capital uh, into that statement and actually say we will we will include sanctions we will force this if we have to force this
Um, how do you or how does the anti-war movement in Israel um, relate to the big like democracy movement from last year? Like, did you see maybe some changes in how you could mobilize people or organize people who are like already maybe very critical of the government and like turn them on being also critical about like the, the war politics? Yeah, I think we are seeing that a lot, especially around the kind of uh, hostage deal movement. Um, and this is a huge protest movement, right? Just two, three weeks ago, um, we had one of the biggest protests in the history of the country um, that was around calling for a deal. Um, and this deal, again, it's it's complicated politically, right? The It does mean a ceasefire um, and within the people who are fighting for this. It's very much the same camp that was kind of the pro-democracy, uh, anti-judicial overhaul camp before October, um, just shifted into calling for for a, um, for a hostage deal and a ceasefire because of that. Um, and within that camp, there's a huge variety of opinions. Um, and some are that huge campaign that we saw of First, we bring them back home, then we go back to Gaza and erase it. Um, but a lot are not. A lot are kind of more close to where we're at, which is saying we want the hostages back home and a ceasefire, it's a win-win. Like, we want to end this war. What What is important is to end this war. Um, and that is definitely a voice within that movement as well. But I think that one of the sad things that happens in, in Israel often is because our political landscape is so right-wing, um, and so militarized, people are afraid to say that that's where they stand because they feel like their cause will lose traction. Um, and, and a lot of people will say we're only fighting for the hostage deal because of the hostages, even though as far as they're concerned, they are also against the war and would like to finish the war, but will not say that as one of their reasons because they feel like it'll harm the chances of it working. Um, which is very sad, but it's it's part of kind of the the reality that we see here. Um, I will say that there are very strong bonds between people who are clearly kind of on the radical side, saying anti-war, and just on the ground with the people who are who are protesting for other reasons uh, against it. And the reactions that we get are often very supportive, um, and a lot of people will you know see our posters on, on in the protests. Um, and they're coming with a with a protest with a slogan that's only about the hostages, and then they see us kind of speaking about dozens as well, and and the need to end it for the sake of everyone. And a lot of people will be like, yeah, I, I do definitely agree with that. Um, and I think that that's it's important to see it, but I don't want to create an illusion saying like, yeah, there's a mass movement, people are shifting, um, people are not shifting, they're not shifting fast enough. What is also shifting people um, is the extreme politicization of the police. Uh, the police has gone through uh, a revolution, I would say, over the past year, um, and is much more right-wing than it was, much more clearly responding to orders from the Minister of Police, uh, Ben Gvir. Um, and people are waking up to that. There is kind of a backlash to that on this pro-democracy uh, group. So it is a very anti-government, anti-right-wing, movement, but it is not yet a pro-peace one. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions here? Currently no hands are raised, but I would wait a bit longer. Okay, it seems there are no more questions. Do you have any last words to say or something you want to let the people know before we end the session? Um, well, I think for me, the, the main, let's say that the reason I even have these conversations, um, other than the fact that it's, you know, it's good to hear people and reach out and, and so on. But I think for me, the main thing is that I do think that as a global left um, and people who care about Palestine, um, and also people who care about Israel, we have a responsibility to start having these conversations of what does a political solution look like? How do we contribute into that political solution? Um, and and to, to repoliticize ourselves as a movement. Uh, now I, I will say I, I like, I hate real politics. I hate, you know, this 
I, I don't think that this means that we need to be more right wing than what we are uh, trying to translate things into practical terms, quote unquote. That's not the goal. The goal is to say, with our radical opinions, within our radical ideology, how do we see change actually happening and what needs to happen for that? Um, and I think that that's just kind of an open invitation um, that I think that, again, I, I know that the situation in Germany is, is very different than other places and the conversations that you need to have there are different are different conversations. Um, and I, I recognize that and respect that. But I think that wherever these conversations, whatever spaces you do feel like these conversations can happen, I think they are crucial um, to be able to actually translate the rage and grief that we are feeling in into change.